we need. All right. I'd like if you would please to turn with me in the Bible to the book of Revelation and the 14th chapter. I'm going to read the first 11 verses. And uh, this is a, a chapter of uh, 20 verses, but the, the, the main answer, the theme of this is answering the two beasts. This is God's answer to the two beasts in chapter 13. And so we'll read verse one. It says this, and I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion and with him an hundred forty and four thousand having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. They are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And there there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us uh, this morning. And so we've said this is really looking at the divine answer to the two beasts that we looked at in Revelation chapter 13. It's again part of this third parenthetic section of the book. Uh, it's not chronological. And so just to remind ourselves that the seals and the trumpets and the vials or bowl judgments mark the chronological sections. This chapter is God's answer to the events in chapter 13. So let's just kind of remind ourselves of the parentheses we've looked at so far. We looked at the first parenthesis in chapter 7, and the question was asked at the end of chapter 6, who will be able to stand? And we saw that there'll be 144,000, and also from them, a great multitude saved that nobody can number. So there will be those that will be able to stand against the beast. The second parenthesis was in chapters 10 through 11, uh, down to verse 13. And it was looking not so much at the question of who will be able to stand, but it's looking at where all these activities are taking place. We'll be looking at, in chapter 10 and 11, the creation itself, which is being claimed uh, for the Lord. We're looking at uh, the city, that great city, Jerusalem, and that's being brought before us in the second parentheses. The third parentheses was chapters 12 through 14. And in 12 through 14, each chapter has a, a specific emphasis. Chapter 12, the purposes of Satan are disclosed. And we see he's cast out of heaven. He's got a short time. Uh, he's very mad. And so his purposes are disclosed. Uh, chapter 13, his puppets are described. Uh, how is he going to accomplish his purposes? He's going to use these two beasts, the one that comes out of the sea, the one from the land. And so the puppets of Satan are described for us 
And in chapter 14, this is a marvelous chapter. It deals with the power of Satan defeated. It shows that all of his plans and all of his schemes and all of his attempts of his puppets is destined to failure. And so the power of Satan defeated. And then there's a fourth parenthesis. We haven't got there yet, but that's Revelation 17, all the way through chapter 19, verse 10. And that deals with the judgment on Babylon, which is dealt with as a separate section altogether. So now as we look at chapter 14, in this chapter, we have seven little pictures. Some people have called them little vignettes, little kind of pictures. And each will show that no matter how dark the conditions, the ultimate triumph of the Lamb and his followers and the ultimate doom of the beast and his followers are assured. And so it's a very encouraging chapter. And so I'm going to run through, just kind of by way of outline, the, the, the seven pictures that are brought before us in this chapter, and then we'll look at them in detail. In verses 1 through 5, the first picture is the sealed of God. Uh, we're going to see, once again, the 144,000. We saw them in chapter 7. We're going to see them again here in chapter 14. And we're going to see that despite all of the power of the beast, he was not able to destroy one of them. There are still 144,000. They've survived the tribulation period. They're with the Lamb on Mount Zion. And so, again, uh, despite his power, he's powerless to touch God's seal. And we're going to learn that lesson in verses 1 through 5. And then chapter 6, uh, 14, verse 6 and 7, second picture is the sound of the gospel. And we're going to see that despite every attempt to silence the message of God, God's message is still going to go out. Now, he's going to use a different means. An angel is going to fly through the heavens proclaiming the gospel. But again, the point is that the beast cannot silence God's message. God will never leave himself without a witness. He'll always be heard. And so the sound of the gospel, verses 6 and 7. Verse 8 it is going to look at the fall of Babylon, the destruction of the harlot is evident in verse 8. Uh, and again, despite its seeming power and its seeming might, God is going to destroy it. And so again, the defeat of Satan and his machinery. And then verses 9 to 11, uh, what's going to happen to those who take uh, worship the image of the beast and take his mark? And we're going to read about the horrible end of those that worship this image and take this mark. And then verse 12 and 13, picture number five, the comfort of the saints. In contrast to the followers of the beast, we're going to look at the, the blessing on the followers of the lamb and how they're comforted and how they're blessed in contrast. And what a beautiful contrast it is. Verses 14 through 16 is going to be picture number six, the gathering of a harvest in the son of man is seen with a sickle. And we're going to tie that in with the gathering of the tares uh, from the world put into the barn, ready to be burned. And the gathering of the harvest, the harvest of man's wickedness has reached a ripeness and the harvest has come for man's wickedness. And then the final one, and verse picture number seven, verse 17 through 20, is the treading of the winepress. And we're going to see uh, the, the, the Lord Jesus basically uh, mopping up and bringing the end to the harvest of wickedness in the world. And so, again, just an amazing chapter, not a simple chapter. In fact, the first time I ever was asked to deal with this chapter was uh, in South Georgia. And there was a, uh, a an elderly sister there. She uh, she was an interesting sister. She was a, a typical old South lady. She had lived in on her own. Her husband had been a doctor. He had passed away. She lived in a big antebellum home, one of these pre-Civil War mansions. And she used to hold a ladies' Bible class, and people would come from all over, different backgrounds, and she would teach the scriptures. 
But when she got to chapter 14 of Revelation, she was going through the book of Revelation. She said, Mike, I just can't do it. Would you mind coming and teaching this chapter? It's so confusing to me. And so I ended up having to study and, and come through the, and go through that chapter. And it was kind of an interesting uh, experience. And so really, it is a difficult chapter. And yet, when you see it as these simple seven pictures showing God's answer to the beast, it really kind of helps. And so, first of all, we're going to look at the presentation of God's witnesses, the 144,000 revisited. And, of course, it's reasonable. You might ask, whatever became of the company that we saw in Revelation chapter 7? Remember, we saw that God sealed 144,000, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And it was mentioned. And then, so what? whatever happened to them? Well, chapter 7 was an, anticip an anticipatory scene. It was anticipating uh, they were sealed prior to going into the tribulation period. So it was anticipating what God was going to do through them at the beginning of the tribulation. It kind of the, before the storm blew on the earth, uh, uh, they, were, they weren't allowed to blow. Uh, the storm was not allowed to come until these uh, were sealed. And so it was anticipating the sealed ones going into the tribulation period. Chapter 14 views them now as the preserved ones coming out of the tribulation and entering into the millennial kingdom. And so there's something reassuring uh, that these saints have gone through the entire seven-year period, and the number is still the same. Still 144,000, not 143,999 or anything less, 144,000. And so it's telling us this, that the beast with all his mighty power, has not been able to destroy a single one of them. He has not defeated the 144,000 because here they are, triumphant, worshipping and standing firm with the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, on Mount Zion. And so the, the simple lesson, and it's a beautiful lesson, is this, that God is more than capable of preserving his servants. My wife and I have been reading a fascinating book about the Lord's work in Syria uh, during the 12-year the conflict. And there was a, one of the amazing things about this book is that the Christians all bought a graveyard and got a plot for each of them, assuming that they would be killed. They weren't going to leave. They intended to stay to be a testimony against ISIS and against everything and the chapter, one of the chapters is about the graveyard that is empty because not one of them to this hour is dead. <laughs> They're still preaching the gospel despite daily threats on their lives. And again, what we can say is this, God is more than capable of preserving his servants. And what a wonderful thing to know that. So the overview of the chapter, will, will it will expand this further, but it's just stayed as, right now as a direct response to the to the previous chapter and the satanic trinity and telling us that Christ's victory is ultimate. It's answering important questions raised by Revelation 13. The beast of Revelation 13 was terrifying and awesome. He even can make war against the saints and overcome them. We saw that in chapter 13, verse 7. It was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And yet, is the beast completely victorious over all of God's people? The answer is no. <laughs> the 144,000 on Mount Zion with the Lamb emphatically says, no, he cannot destroy them all. Still, God has his preserved saints. And so, uh, we'll, as we look in more detail, we might call verses 1 through 5 the reward for the faithful witnesses. And it's fulfilled when Christ sits on Mount Zion. And we're going to think a lot about this Mount Zion here, but I want you just to read a scripture we know it very well and it's in psalm 2 it's an amazing psalm uh, that uh, 
partly. Uh, the disciples saw fulfillment at least partially at the time of Christ's first advent, but there is a future aspect to it too. And so, of course, it's the, the heathen raging, the people imagine a vain thing, kings of the earth setting themselves and the rulers taking counsel against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder, cast away their cords from us. He that sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord will have them in der derision. Then shall he speak to them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. And then he says this, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. And God's ultimate purpose is that he is going to set his king, the Lord Jesus, on Mount Zion. Now, the details of that, what we call the millennial reign of Christ, we will see when we get to Revelation 20 and verses 4 through 6, where Christ is going to reign over the earth. But here we're getting a, an anticipation of it because we're just asking what happened to the 144,000. And we're being shown that they survived the tribulation and they are standing with the Lamb on Mount Zion. And so uh, just to kind of overview this chapter, so you've got verses 1 through 5, the reward of faithful witnesses. And from verse 6 down to verse 20, we're going to see the recompense of divine wrath on those that followed the evil one. And so it's kind of a contrast, the reward of faithful witnesses and the recompense of divine wrath for those that believed the lie and followed the deceiver. And so it says in verse one, and I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. I've already see, seen in uh, Psalm 2, verse 6, God's plan to set his king on his holy hill of Zion. We might ask the question, well, where is Zion? Well, Second Samuel will help us to know the exact location of Zion, where Christ is going to uh, reign as king over all the earth, despite all of man's attempts, the heathen raging and the opposition and so we see 2 Samuel 5 and verse 7. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same is the city of David. So there we have it. It's the city of David, the city of the great king. That is Zion. And so the lamb on Mount Zion, the former scene of the glory during the reign of David and Solomon, now the descendant of David is standing once again on Mount Zion. And he has with him an escort of 144,000 faithful witnesses. They gathered on Mount Zion because Zion, the ancient name for the hills that make up Jerusalem, is the place where the Messiah gathers his redeemed and reigns over the earth. And again, I want to just uh, look at this because there's so much scripture that talks about this place called Mount Zion and where it's going to be the place of rule and reign uh, of the Messiah. Look at Psalm 48. We're going to look at a, a number of references, uh, just important to understand because there's there is some uh, believers who believe that this is speaking of heaven and not of the earth. And of course, they base it on Hebrews 12. Uh, one reference, they base their whole theology on one reference in Hebrews 12, when there's replete references to it also having an earthly counterpart. And so let's look at Psalm 48, verse 1 and 2. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Verse 10, according to thy name, O God, so is thy praise unto the ends of the earth. Thy right hand is full of righteousness. Let Mount Zion rejoice. Let the daughters of Judah be glad because of thy judgments. Walk about Zion, go round about her, tell the towers thereof, mark ye well her bulwarks, consider her palaces, that you may tell it to the generation following. For this God is our God forever and ever will be our guide 
even unto death. And so clearly an earthly scene, Mount Zion, sides of the north. Look at the prophecy of Isaiah and Isaiah 24. Just looking at this idea of Mount Zion, uh, verse 23, it says, Then the moon shall be confounded and the sun ashamed when the Lord of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and before his ancients glor gloriously. Now, again, notice that Mount Zion and in Jerusalem before his ancients gloriously. Uh, the moon not confounded, the sun ashamed, clearly an earthly scene. Joel, prophecy of Joel, just kind of putting some evidence together. Joel chapter 2 and verse 32. And it shall come to pass that whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. And then uh, a lesser known prophet, Obadiah, but he has something to say again about my, Mount Zion. Again, these minor prophets, I always struggle finding my way around them. John and Micah, Nahum, and especially one like Obadiah, which is only one chapter long. Okay, Obadiah chapter 1. As there is only one chapter and a couple of references here, verse 17. It says, But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Down in verse 21. And Savior shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. And then one more minor prophet, Micah, just pulling all this together. Micah, of course, we know Micah chapter 5, but now Micah chapter 4. And verse 1. Micah 4, verse 1. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and the people shall flow unto it. And many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Then down in verse 10, sorry, verse 7, it says, And I will make her that halted a remnant, and her that was cast off a strong nation, and the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth, even forever. So I think when you see that, you see that there's a wealth of Scripture that talks about the Lord Jesus reigning over his people on Mount Zion. And so we see here uh, in Revelation 14, I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion and with him 144,000. So again, I do believe we're looking at a purely earthly scene. Christ on Zion reigning. This is the millennial kingdom. The 144,000 have come through unscathed and now they are reigning with him. The Lord had stated back in 1 Samuel, we studied this together in chapter 2, verse 30, them that honor me, I will honor. And I believe the 144,000 are certainly going to be honored in that coming day. There they are. They've been loyal to him during this period, this dark period on the earth. They've been loyal to the Lamb. And so they're being honored. Uh, they're almost like an imperial guard surrounding him, uh, escorting him wherever he goes. <clears throat> also notice it talks about the fact that they have uh, his father's name written in their foreheads. Remember the this tribulation period, it's kind of a period where uh, there's no hiding a person's allegiance. 
the beast followers have his mark on their foreheads or on their right arm. And so the 144,000 clearly also were sealed, and we're learning more about that seal. And what is that seal? Well, it tells us that it written on their foreheads is their father's name written. So there's no question as to their allegiance. It's written. You look at them, you see their allegiance. And so it's evident to whom they belong. And that's going to be quite a day, really, in a sense. It's going to be a, a no time to hide. It's going to be a day where people will clearly uh, have their allegiance written upon them. Is it evident who we belong to? We may not, and we wouldn't advise having a, a tattoo of the Father's name on our foreheads, but we should live in a way that people can tell who we belong to and whose we are and whom we serve. And so the 144,000 are like the young Jewish men who survived the fiery furnace in Daniel chapter 3. They prove God's ability to preserve his people. So now verse 2, it says, and I heard a voice from heaven. Now, the fact that he's hearing a voice from heaven would indicate that he is witnessing this earthly scene and he's he hearing the voice from heaven. Uh, suggesting that neither he nor the 144,000 are currently there, they're on this earthly scene, hearing the voice from heaven. And what is that voice like? Well, he gives us some details. He says, uh, as the voice of many waters, reminiscent of the voice of Christ in Revelation 1 verse 15. And so there's kind of majesty in that sound, isn't there? Just like that, that, the thundering waters of the Niagara Falls, that kind of majestic sound, sound of many waters. And then he says the voice of a great thunder. Back in Psalm 29, it talks about the voice of the Lord and being the, the thunder sound. And so no other voice can compete. There's kind of overtones of deity here. No, no competing voice. Sound of many waters, voice of great th thunder, voice of harpers harping. There's sweetness to the sound, soothing to the spirit as the voice of harpers harping. And then it says in verse three that they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song, but the 140 and 4,000, which were redeemed from the earth. So there's a song sung. Now, the question is, who is singing this, this song? Remember, we're hearing this voice from heaven, and part of that is uh, the voice of harpers harping with their harps, and they sung, as it were, a new song. And so who are these harpers, and what is the new song that they're singing? Well, when we get to chapter 15, and we're on our way there, but when we get to chapter 15, we'll see who is singing this song. And so it tells us in chapter 15, verse 2, it says, I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. And so the, the thought here is this, that, the group on earth, 144,000, are hearing from heaven the song of the martyred saints of the hundred, you know, of the tribulation period, and they're able to learn that song and they're hearing that song. Now, again, there's many examples of scenes on earth where um, a voice is heard from heaven. We know some of them very well, don't we? Uh, the baptism of the Lord Jesus was there message from heaven this is my beloved son in whom i'm well pleased hear ye him john chapter 12 uh, father glorify thy, thy name and then we hear i have glorified it i will glorify it again right coming from heaven and so here's the scene group on earth hearing the song sung before the the throne in heaven and nobody else can learn it but the 144,000. they're learning the song the victory song of Moses and the Lamb at this point. 
as they enter into this period. And so what it tells us is this, the throne of the government of the universe is now linked with Mount Zion in Jerusalem at the commencement of the millennial reign of Christ. Two groups, one laid down their lives, the other suffered and were preserved, and they both sing together the song of Moses and the Lamb. And so verse 4, it says, speaking again of the 144,000, it says that were redeemed from the earth. They are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from, the, from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. So we get a little look at the moral character of the 144,000. It says they were not defiled with women. Moral and spiritual purity in days of great corruptions. Many uh, take the virginity of the 144,000, because it says they are virgins, simply a symbol of their general purity. And in, in order to suggest that, they will link it with 2 Corinthians 11. Let's just look there, 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2. 2 Corinthians 11 and verse 2, where he says, For I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And so the idea is, uh, loyalty to the Lord Jesus in a day of departure, in a day of idolatry. And so they say that this is all that is implied, that they're not literal virgins, but they are simply those that are loyal to the Lord Jesus and pure morally and spiritually. However, just an interesting thought that Paul, at one point in 1 Corinthians 7, recommended celibacy. And there was a reason. And it's called the present distress in uh, 1 Corinthians 7 and from verse 25 uh, down to verse 35. Uh, he recommends it because of what he calls the present distress. And, um, and, and he wants them to be able to serve the Lord without distraction and not, and not be concerned about the present distress. Well, uh, we won't take the time to read that, but I want you just to think about this. Can you imagine the difficulty for the 144,000 if they were married? And the beast can't touch them, but what if he got their wives and tortured them? <laughs> Would be very challenging, wouldn't it, for them to have to watch this? And, and so uh, there's some thought that maybe they, they really were, for this time of distress, both spiritually pure, but also uh, they weren't married. Now, again, we want to just say this, that it, that it's it, marriage is not defiling and the marriage bed is undefiled. There's nothing. It's holy. It's right. It's a good, good thing. It's a wholesome thing. God never says that it's defiling. But again, I think the thought here is that these perhaps because it is a difficult time. Remember, the Lord says, when you see the abomination, woe to them that are with child or give suck in those days. And so there's a good possibility that the 144,000 were actually, um, and Paul, remember, he said, I wish you were even as I am, uh, serving the Lord without distraction in a difficult day. So it could be that they're literally celibate, but there's certainly no question about it that they are loyal to the Lord. And certainly that term virgin, um, it's used particularly, again, emphasizing the Jewishness of these 144,000. Uh, oftentimes, Israel is referred to as the virgin daughter of Zion. Um, in Second Kings, in Isaiah 37, uh, Lamentation, the virgin of Israel, and many occurrences where they're referred to as the virgin daughter of Zion. So these, again, what we can say is this. These are people who are madly in love with Christ. They're not distracted. Uh, their devotion to him is, is unquestioned. And so it says they are not defiled with women. They are virgins. These are they that follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth. 
their affection for the lamb is such that wherever he is, that's where they want to be. Wherever he goes, they want to go. And so it's almost like some have seen them as kind of like a a, a guard that uh, follow him, a new form of guard of honor. Wherever he goes, they go. The only closer relationship that anybody will have with Christ in the millennium is the, the bride itself. The 144,000 will be very close to him. He says that they're the first fruits. And of course, we know that the first fruits is a guarantee of a greater harvest. And of course, their salvation prior to going into the tribulation period is a guarantee that there's going to be a much bigger harvest amongst the Jewish people. And Paul uh, refers in Romans 11 to a day coming when the nation of Israel uh, will indeed believe in their Messiah en masse. And so it says in Romans eleven twenty six, it says, And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. And so the first fruits, there's going to be a greater harvest, a great in gathering of Jewish people uh, in uh, this last time. And then it says, there's no guile found in their mouth. It says in verse five, and in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. No guile. They're, they would remind you of their Lord, because it was said of him, that neither was any guile found in his mouth. But I think that there's a very specific tribulation reference here, because the idea of guile is the idea of deceit or lie. And one thing we can say is that there'll be a lot of people who are believing the lie, right? Second Thessalonians 2, 11, uh, people are going to be compelled to believe the lie. And these, no lie will be found in their mouth. They are loyal to the truth. They're men of truth. They didn't believe the lie. They don't, they don't give out the message of the lie, uh, or give any credence to the liar. They are loyal to the Lord, and they're men of truth. No guile in their mouth. And then it says, without fault. And again, that's a, uh, like the language of uh, the uh, a lamb without spot or blemish, uh, or any such thing. Uh, their, their, their character is that of holiness. They're, they're certainly devoted servants of the lamb, and they are like him in so many ways. Uh, they remind you of the Lamb. They're no guile, no without fault before the throne of God. And so, what a testimony the 144,000 will have in a day of great wickedness. They're really going to stand out. And so, they survived the tribulation. But what about the rest of the chapter? Well, it now deals with the recompense of divine wrath. It, it lifts the veil and shows that chapter 13, rather than being the triumph of Satan, was in fact the prelude to his utter defeat. <laughs> so we have the reward of faithful service to God in 1 through 5, and now we're going to see the recompense for those that have showed wickedness and believed the lie. But before that, there's the final kind of warning to mankind the gospel. And so he says, I saw another angel. Now, I want to just mention something that's kind of structural before we look at this in the chapter. In chapter 14, you have six angels mentioned. And six angels, and then in the mid, and they're, they're in two groups of three, three angels. And then there's the Son of Man revealed the Lord Jesus, and then there are three more angels. So let me just run you through it. Verse 6, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. That's number one. And then verse 8, there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen. Verse 9, and the third angel followed them. So that's how we can say the first one is one, two, this is the third angel. And then you go to verse 14, I looked and behold a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man. So there's the Lord. And then verse 15, another angel. Verse 17, 
and another angel, and then verse 18, and another angel. So you've got six angels, three and three, but in the middle is Christ. And the whole point is when you have these kind of structures is they, they're designed to make sure the center of attention goes to the middle person. <laughs> and so these all, angels are all pointing towards the one who is the son of man. He is to be the one in the center stage. God always wants his son to have that central stage place. So first thing, the sound of the gospel. I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people saying with a loud voice, fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. Worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. So what a very interesting verse. You see, the last time you had an angel flying in heaven was giving a different message back in revelation eight and verse 13 you we read this i beheld and i heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice woe 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 to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound so what a contrast you've got one angel flying through the the heavens, and he's proclaiming a message, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. Now we have another angel fly in the midst of heaven with an altogether different message, having the everlasting gospel, the ageless gospel, the ever relevant gospel. And it's really God's final message, if you like, to offer salvation and to warn of the unspeakable consequences of rejecting Christ. It's preached to the earth dwellers. It says, having the everlasting gospel to preach the, to them that dwell on the earth. And so these earth dwellers who generally have been happy to live on this earth without God and without Christ, and, and they don't want to be disturbed. And yet, God is always faithful to warn men before judgment. And this is, in a sense, the last warning. And so what is the message? Well, again, we've got to think through this. First of all, he says, fear God. And so he says, saying with a loud voice, fear God. And the reason he's saying fear God is, fear God, don't fear the beast. Remember, the beast is pretty fe uh, fearsome character, but you're going to have to deal with God. And so his message is fear God, not the beast. The tragedy is that man generally has lost the fear of God. Uh, Romans chapter 3, looking at the, the terrible condition of the depravity of humanity, and it's neither is there any fear of God before their eyes. And yet the message is fear God. Don't fear the beast. Fear God. And then give glory to him, not to the image of the beast. Give glory to him. The thing that he is denied. Man was made for the purpose of glorifying his creator. Give glory to him. And again, you can't give glory to him if you reject his son. To give glory to him is to acknowledge his son who he loves. And so give glory to him, not to the image of the beast. This is an hour where men's destinies are sealed. It's a de decisive hour. Who are you going to give glory to? You're going to give glory to the beast and then suffer the consequences? Or are you going to give glory to God through honoring his son? Worship him. While the beast is claiming worship from men, men are told to turn away from worshiping the creature and worship the creator. And so it says, worship him. And it says, that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. These very things that God has made are now experiencing these judgments, right? The, the judgments are falling uh, on the earth uh, in and the sea and the fountains of water, and even the heavens are being shaken. And so 
the same one who is the creator is also the one who is bringing these judgments. And so give glory to him, worship him. God who created is the same God who is now acting in judgment. Now, normally, angels are not given the task of preaching the gospel. It's given to men. When Cornelius, uh, an angel appeared to Cornelius, he told him, go get Peter, and Peter will tell you words whereby you might be saved. Now, if we were living in the tribulation period, all the angel would have to do is give him the gospel, <laughs> but it's not his responsibility, right? It's it's the, our responsibility to go with the gospel. But in this, this last period of the tribulation period, it's becoming increasingly difficult for men to be able to proclaim the message. And so because the conditions are so extreme at this point, an entirely new method is required. God is still determined not to leave himself without a witness. And just like God sent two angels to warn any that might still be righteous in Sodom to get out before the judgment, God now sends a final angel to warn men, this is a day of decision. You need to make the right decision. And so it's one of the very last calls of grace to an apostate world. Now, of course, we want to say this, the gospel, both Old Testament and New Testament, is based solely on the work of Christ at Calvary. And no one ever has or ever will be saved apart from that man of Calvary. But this message is, listen, this is a day of decisions. You need to fear God. You need to worship God. You need to glorify God. What's the best way to show all of those things is to accept his son, the Lord Jesus, as your personal Savior and Lord. And so this is his message. And so <clears throat> the message of the angel, the last, as it were, call of grace to an apostate world before the wrath of God falls. And then notice picture three, the fall of Babylon. And so it says, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornications. This is the first of six references to Babylon named in the book of Revelation. And so it's the first time it's mentioned, but we're going to see a lot of it. Let's just look at the references quickly. And so chapter 16 and verse 19, it says, And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Chapter 17, verse 5. Upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. Chapter 18, verse 2. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. Chapter 18, verse 10, it says, standing afar off from the fear of her torment, saying, alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. And then verse 21 says, And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. So obviously, the Lord has got a lot to say about this place called Babylon. Now, what is this great city Babylon that is being referred to here. Babylon, Babylon is fallen, that great city. We have to go back to the book of Genesis. Remember, we said a lot of things in the book of Revelation have their origins in the book of Genesis. 
And in the book of Genesis, in chapters 10 and 11, we meet a character called Nimrod. He's kind of the original rebel. And Nimrod, um, he built a city. And maybe we'll just look there for a second in, in Genesis 11, and we'll see some of the things about this city that he intended to build. Verse 3, it says, and they said, this is chapter 11 of Genesis, verse 3, they said one to another, go, let us, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach to heaven and let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And so, what is this Babylonian spirit that's evident here? First of all, notice let us. It, it tells us that man is the source of this. This is not God's revelation. God has already said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. In other words, spread out over the earth. No, we're going to stay together. Let us. Man is the source of the Babylonian system. Let us make us. Man is the means. Not only are we going to do it, uh, we, we are, we're suggesting it. We can do it. Uh, let us, and then the final thing is a name. Let us, the man is the reason. Let us make a name for ourselves. And so it's a, a system that's all about the glory of man and man's skill, man's capability, what man can do. And so, of course, we know that God confused the languages and turned Babel, Babel, which was the gate of God, into Babel, which is a scene of noisy confusion. He confused their languages. And by the way, those of us that have interacted with other languages know that he did a fantastic job of confusing the languages. And so what happened when all these people were scattered according to their language groups? Well, they took the Babylonian philosophy with them wherever they went okay that babylonian spirit all about man all about man's glory and it's shown up throughout different times in history um, it's a literal city uh, we saw babylon the great the empire back in the days of daniel a literal city a political empire in a religious system and it spread across the world appearing in various gui guises and it's covered the world with its idolatry. And so it's not surprising that in the close at the end of the age, the last book in the Bible, Babylon will once again appear. In fact, one of the things that we could say about the Bible is that it is the real tale of two cities. Not Dickens' book, A Tale of Two Cities, about London and Paris, but this is the real tale of two cities, about Jerusalem, Mount Zion, as we've been thinking about, in Babylon. Jerusalem, Mount Zion, is the place where God has chosen to place his name. And Babylon is the place where man has chosen to make a name for himself. <laughs> and so this is the, the contrast, you see. And so it's interesting that ultimately when Babylon falls, we get to Revelation 19 and we get the real hallelujah chorus. And the real hallelujah chorus, six times you'll hear hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And it's the reason is that Babylon, that hateful system that is so man-centered, has finally fallen so that the true city of God the place he's chosen to place his name will last forever and ever. Now, just an interesting little thing. Um, kind of on the, the YouTube channel, sometimes I get correspondence from people. And uh, one person suggested that actually Babylon was really Jerusalem. And the reason was, in his thinking, uh, was based on, Revelation 11, verse 8, where it says, um, And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Now, let's just say this, that um, uh, it doesn't say 
the great city, Sodom and Egypt and Babylon. It just great city, which is called Sodom and Egypt. But the fact that it says great city, uh, this correspondent felt that it linked with uh, chapter 14, verse 8. There followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. And so he's comparing the great city with the great city. And of course, the difficulty with that is that in the Bible, there are, and in the world today, are there is there just one great city or are there many great cities? And as we've said in the Bible, there are two great cities that are in view. And Revelation 16, verse 19, I think, distinguishes the two cities, uh, one being Jerusalem. And so it says in verse 19, and the great city was divided into three parts. That's Jerusalem. This is Armageddon. This is the armies coming against God and against Jerusalem. The great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And then it says, And great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give to her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. So again, I would suggest that there are two great cities in view. There is that great city, which is Jerusalem. For certainly, it is a great city in the purposes of God. And there is also Babylon, that great city. And so we're really dealing with two great cities. And one of them will be destroyed and will never appear again. And the other one will be the city that will be dominant on the world stage. Because from Mount Zion, the Lord Jesus will reign over the whole world. And we would say, even so, come Lord Jesus, but our time is gone.